All right. Uh, in the next six, lect six lectures, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, computational neuroscience. So basically, we use uh, mathematical tools and the computer models to try to help us to understand how brain works. So the first question, how, wh what is brain made of? Uh, of course, we all know uh, brain is made of neurons. Their uh, neurons are connected to each other. So it's very different from every other cell in the body. The neurons, they reach out to a long distance to talk to other neurons. Um, so, so I'm going to, today I'm going first um, talk about a few models of individual neurons. So that basically describe how a single cell works. And then we'll describe some neural networks. Basically you connect different neurons to form a circuit to do something useful, right? So the simplest, the, the most realistic models uh, of a neuron is called the compartmental model, the compartment model. Uh, there are other simplified models, like integrated fire and stochastic model and firing rate model. So um, I first talk about this compartment model. What is that? So this model basically is based on uh, the standard uh, Hodgkin-Huxley uh, Hodgkin Hodgkin dynamics. You have already learned uh, the Hodgkin-Huxley dynamics in SBE1 and the other lectures, right? So I'm not going to talk about the, the details, right? So basically, <coughs> as we know, if you have a neuron like this, let me see my cursor, uh, yeah. You can simplify this neuron. It's made of some geometric compartments. It's a ball with cylinders. Right? Each of these compartments has those some ion channels that may depend on voltage. You have a, you remember, you have a sodium channel, potassium channel, and other channels. And <coughs> so for each of these compartments, we have uh, a, uh, a system of alternate differential equation. You already learned that, right? How the thing works, right? how the voltage may affect the channel, the channel you know, affects the current, and affects the voltage, and so on. <coughs> but once you put all the things together, so the whole thing will work as a dynamical system, right? If you give some inputs, it will evolve in time, right? It gives some output. So one thing interesting about neurons, standard neurons, is that if I give you this neuron, right, this is just single units in the brain, so what's the input to this device? We know it's, its function is to process information. Right? It doesn't handle matter, it handles information, but what's the input? It's all the dendrites. Where are the dendrites? There are all these things here. There are all these things here, and the things here, they're all the inputs. So a neuron has many different inputs, right? But what's the output? A typical neuron has a single output. Basically, receive lots of information, but they only send out one information. They're going this, uh, this thing here is axon. It's just one thing, right? You already learned that in your previous lectures. So, <coughs> Those kind of model, you know, when, when someone gets into the modeling for the first time, you always believe the most realistic model must be the best. That's not true at all. The reason is that you have a complex model like this, there are lots of parameters. For example, how many N channels, what's the density of a channel in different compartments, right? And how different neurons are connected to each other. There are thousands of connections, it's extremely complicated. And to get all that parameter, it's almost impossible for most animals. Maybe there are a couple exceptions. Um, so for most cases, actually, so you're much better off to use a simplified model. You can simplify this, you connect all these dendrites together at a single you know, cylinder, or even you know, simplify the neuron at a single ball, a single point. Um, so that's not completely wrong, but actually you can capture uh, lots of information and can be very useful in application. I will show you some examples just later in my lecture. It's just surprisingly powerful, even you have the most simplified model. <coughs> so this is an example of uh, this complex model, this compartmental model. So this is an early example. That's, it's, a it's a Purkinje cell. Right? This is, you know, this is a, basically the only output of the cerebellum. Right? So it's just one type of cell, put Purkinje cell in your, in your lecture. Uh, so these neurons have this very weird geometry. This is like a one-dimensional uh, distribution of the of the dendrites. So this this is really shown here, just a, a, a compartmental model. So each the segments of different compartments, and the color means activity. The activity in the soma, or activity start from here, the propagating, and so on. You can do this kind of model. As you can imagine, uh, you 
don't have all the data. You don't know how the, you know, all different ion channels are distributed in the entire, you know, branchings of how the, the genetic trees. So that's almost impo impossible today. So you have, you have to make a lot of, a lot of assumptions. So for realistic model, is that you have a lot of free parameters, sometimes just too many, right? But it's good to have this kind of model because you want to know, know, to know the ground truth, right? If you have some hypothesis, you want to test what's, its, what's, its, uh, con what's, con what's the consequences. So <coughs> for simplified model, sometimes it doesn't matter. So no, you know, for some neurons, like in the, in the hippocampus especially, and for some cells, even in the neocortex, the location of the synapse, basically input from other cells, uh, the, the effect on the cell body, because we know there's only a single output, it's not shown here, uh, from starting from the cell body of a typical cell. So, you know, the inputs where you're located doesn't matter that much. You know, what's important is what's your effect on the final output for that cell, right? So for many neurons, like in the hippocampus, you know, the location of the, the dendrite doesn't really matter. It's really, you know, if you're very far away, you, 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 we presume the effect will be smaller, but actually there's some way to amplify the signal. So the total effect <coughs> at the, at the soma is, is about the same. In the cortex, it's, le it's less true, but you know, it's a, you know, you know that so it's not completely uh, wrong to assume that a neuron just summarizes all the input to, from all different sources. So I, I will get into detail of that. <coughs> um, so one popular <coughs> simplified spiking model is called the integrated farm model. So the model is extremely simple. So you basically, you have the equation looks like this. So this is a capacitor C, this R is a resistor. Right? This equation is very familiar in people with any, you know, the basic electronic circuit is called the uh, RC circuit, a uh, resistor and a capacitor. So for this system, this is just like a describe, you're also familiar with this from your learning of the hodgkin huxley uh, dynamics, right? It's, a, it's just a, a piece of passive membrane, that's how it's supposed to behave. If you don't do anything, it just decays ex exponentially to its resting state, right? That's very simple. In this model, you just behave like that. Um, so this is just describe this. If you have, so this is like an input I, like this, a current, and then the membrane potential go, you know, in time, just like a, looks like a, like a low-pass filter and moves slowly. So the the model has a nonlinear part. It's called there's a threshold. So you follow this linear equation, but whenever your membrane potential reach some threshold, then the spike occurs. So this model doesn't model what's the mechanism of that spike. You know the spike is very stereotyped, right? It's almost looks like the same, right? But when you hit that, there's an all or none event, that something will happen. So here, you, you, we don't model that, and just say, okay, once you, you know, reach a threshold, there's a spike happen, and then it, there's a reset. We know it's based on the potassium channel in the hodgkin huxley model. Somehow you reset and make memory potential lower. So we don't model that. You say, okay, you just have a spike, and then you just re reset to some kind of reset level. So, so this is the only part that's non-linear. Once you have the spike, then you go back to the equation again. Once you <coughs> start from reset, you follow this equation again, do the same thing. Once you reach a circle, do a spike. So this is a very simple model. Um, a model is even simpler than this, is a sort of firing rate model. So based on this, okay, in many cases, the exact spike timing doesn't matter. In some cases, it's exact, exact timing is actually matter. But I will, I, will t I, will, I, will, I will describe both cases in my uh, future lectures. But in, some, in many cases, the exact spike timing doesn't matter, right? Because you know, action potential is stereotyped all or none, right? So what information it, it can carry? The amplitude, it doesn't carry any information because it's exactly the same, right? The only thing it can carry information so is, is the timing. So if you're a neuron, imagine you're a neuron, you receive information from another neuron, what that neuron tells you, over long distance, there's only one way the information can be communicated to you is by the spikes. The spikes are stereotyped, it's only information timing, all right? So if you, in many cases, the exact timing doesn't matter. What matters is uh, the frequency, you know, how many spikes per second you actually, re you actually uh, <coughs> re receive. If you do the integral fire model, you show that you know, have the mean input current, like say if you have uh, this, like a random looking current, that's because your, Neuron receive bombardment of synapse from many other neurons. So each have a, you know, you, you, you learn that the EPSP, IPSP, you know, that's a synaptic events, very short, a few milliseconds. But those events, you add them all up, the total effect would be some, in a, in a natural in a case, in the brain, you can imagine the input to the total input of the brain would be fluctuating like this. Right? <coughs> um, so if I see what's the average level of the current, uh, and you plot the firing rate number spike 
it hurts. Uh, as a function of the mean current, you get some curve look like this. If your current is very low or negative, then there's no firing, right? And then if your, uh, as your current increases, firing rate will increase. Well, this, for m for m so this is a very simple model to capture this property. This is actually true for most cells, right? You see in the brain. <coughs> of course, there are different depend on if you use random input versus constant, like a step-like input. Step-like inputs, you have a sharp, elect sharp uh, threshold. You know, if you are below a certain level, there is no spike whatsoever, right? If you use stochastic random inputs, there's always a chance you know, different you know, input lined up such that you get some spike. Right? So this is just like so. This is like monotonically increasing. So the input of relationship. So basically, in this kind of model, you describe a neuron. At a device, so it's an input output device. You give input, there's output. So this transfer function just looks like this, right? Just give input, there's output. So the typically used input output relationship, a single neuron, this kind of model, the firing rate model, right? Uh, those three are the most typical. One is called a sigmoidal function or logistic function. It looks like a sigmoidal curve, a gentle increase, and you know. <coughs> So this function, as you can see, it, it, it varies from zero to one. So if your input x is very large, the exponential is almost uh, approaches zero, right? So this, this is one, this is the largest value you can achieve. So if your x is negative, uh, <coughs> so this exponential is going to be very large. So this y equal approach, approach to zero. So this thing basically is a, it's a monotonically increasing function between zero and one, all right? Sometimes people use stuff, you can, you, can, you can add a k here to change the slope, or you can change, add another constant to, 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 to shift it around to, to have a acting at like a threshold. Right? This is very widely used, the most typical used uh, the, f the input output function for, for a simple, simple neuron. Right? So there's another case, much simpler, called a step function, called a heavy side function. Just, that would be correspond to this case. If you, that's a k approach infinity, it's extremely you know, steep as, as approach this step function. So another type is also very important, it's called the threshold linear function. Basically, it's a linear function. You only take the positive part. So if it's negative, you take it as zero, right? If it's a positive, you just, just, you, just, you just keep it. So basically, if your input is too low, is there nothing, hap there nothing here? Let me see, well, where's my ass? And there's nothing. But once you reach some threshold, you have a linear function. It's another type that's used. So, so basically, all these things capture the fact that you have a threshold. And usually, your input increases, uh, your output also increases. Right? Sometimes you can, they're, they're set, they're set, uh, uh, saturation. Those are very simple, you know, simple models we typically use. <coughs> so the simplest model of neuron, if I put with things together, is called a, 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 a perceptron. So it looks very simple. So you have a bunch of inputs. Okay, so input means input from uh, from uh, from uh, other cells, right? Then you have a weight. So the weight, this W, means the, the strength of the synapse. How strong is this, the two cell connected? So basically, you basically the input x i, and weighted by the strength of the synapse. You add them all up. It's a linear sum. Right? You can add the threshold, the changes, and it goes through a sort of called gain function. The gain function is just that we show the least kind of function, the input output and you know, all right? <laughs> so the idea is that this model is I just summarize all the input from all the cells, from all the dendrites, add them all together. That's a total input, right? And then you pass through this nonlinear function, which you basically transfer into the output of my neuron. So what's m if your input is too low, I have no output. I'm, I'm quiet, right? If you have input strong enough, I'm going to fire. The firing rate is just given by this function, right? It's, you cannot be simpler than this kind of model, right? So this is very extremely simple. You may wonder, is such a simple model like this may not be, may not be too trivial. It's not, it's not interesting. No, it's, it's actually not true. It's very interesting. I'm going to show you some examples, all right? So if you Put this neuron together, you can wire them up in the, in the, in the, in the network. There are two basic distinctions. It's called feed forward network like this. So basically, you look at this one ball here. This is one neuron. You receive input from a bunch of inputs, right? But you have uh, several of them in parallel. But these neurons, they don't interfere with each other. Right? This neuron receives a bunch of inputs, do the same. The other neurons do the same, right? They don't interfere with each other. And you can go further. You know, this neuron receive the, the, the output of this neuron would be act as an input to a higher layer. Right? This is a hierarchical structure. So each neuron works exactly the same way I told you before. So this is called the feed-forward network. Basically, the connection 
is a, like a tree-like structure. There's no loops. Right? Or, or, or the another type is called recurrent. I mean, you can you know go back to it to, to, to yourself. It goes around and you go. You, there are loops in the network. It's called recurrent. Right? That's just basic distinction. But what does a real brain look like? What's the, a real brain looks like this. This is the only animal we actually know how the wiring diagram of the brain works. This is a C. elegans. It's a free-living worm. Right? It's very small. It's simple, but so this animal is very interesting that they. They're identical. You look at different animals, their nervous system has exactly the same number of cells, 302 neurons. And they're connecting in, in, the, in, the, in the same way. Right? And if the two cells in one neuron you know, are connected in the same way, the other neuron kind of exactly the same, even though the strength of them may be different. Right? Their behavior is very similar. So for those kind of neurons, you don't want them to vote. Why do you vote? They really have the exact same idea, right? They really wire in the same way, behave very similar ways. Uh, so this is the, for this neuron, it says, what are the neurons? So this is the animal. Where are the neurons? Because for, you are so familiar with the diagram. A neuron looks like a tree with a lot of you know, elaborate structure. Why do you have those kind of elaborate trees? Because you want to reach out to connect with many other cells. For this neuron, there are not many, many other cells, only a few cells. So this neuron looks like a very stubby, like a simple, not many branchings, because there are really no need. Right? Uh, and for this neuron, you see they're connected with each other. There's a, only a part of the circuitry. The entire circuitry has been uh, figured out. Right? That's the only animal. And, and this is a, if you look at that, you see that this is a really uh, recurrent network. Everybody potentially connects with every other body. Right? So not, except for maybe some neuron. Like if you're a motor neuron, you only receive input from the side. You only go to muscle. You don't go to other neuron anymore. Right? If you're a sensory neuron, you get raw information from other side. The interface with the world, then you go to other neuron. I don't know, you usually don't go to you, but you know, some, some of them you may have, f have feedback as well. So typically, a uh, recurrent network is the uh, most typical structure. Right? There are also feeds for, uh, if you look at the brain, like this higher level brain, like the, 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 the most complex one is a mammal. The cortex is the is a most complex structure in the, in the brain. Um, <coughs> so this is a, from Kahaf's drawing. You see all the neurons. Um, so I would say that, so 80% of the human brain, when you open up your skull, everything you see is a cortex, or right? so it's, 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 it's outside. Uh, so the white matter, so this is green matter, all the cell, the cell body, the dendrites. So the white matter of the axon, we, know, we just said that each cell has the one, uh, one output, maybe branching, it goes to the, all the bundle of axons, they try to connect with each other, that's the, with the white matter, it's all, all, all the fibers, so the long distance axons. So, so then the eight percent of axon in the white matter in the, is really connection between different parts of the neocortex. The only two percent connect to the like a lower level brain area and connect to the outside world. Either the, your, mo your motor out output when you're on, like for a human, you only have a, you have billions of neurons, right? The axon, you know, from your eyes into your brain. How many axon per eye do you think you have? Do you get you know, other magnitude? <laughs> Only like one million. It's like a, if you make that a camera, it's like a one megapixel. Nobody going to buy that. If you have iPhone, the new one, I don't know how many, like a f eight megapixel, right? That has eight times more axon than your than your eye from your brain. It's much many more. You're a good, good camera at least, like twenty megapixel many more. So we don't have that many information actually into your brain. So you, the information going out, like how many you know megapixel actually comes from movement of your hand. From your motor cortex go down, that's only about one million axons. Other billions, billions of axons actually is all in land apron. Most others are just really talking to each other. So the machines really they're interwired. It's have a very little tiny connection with outside the world. That's it, just anchored to, to, to reality. Um, so the, let's just say recurrent network is a, is a typical kind of network in the brain. So you are probably familiar with this feed for uh, model. Uh, it's called uh, it, by by the human whistle for the visual cortex, right? You, you you know that for the visual cortex, the cell like it's symmetry. It's have a symmetry breaking. In your eyes, in your uh, salamus, the cells are symmetric. They don't care the orientation. They like a center surround kind of you have to feel structure. You will learn in your uh, visual lecture, I believe, right? So when you go to cortex, it's the first time it becomes no longer symmetric. It's like elongated bars, which can be important for detecting edges. And that's the boundary of objects, right? So 
This model is that you, this kind of more complex response, the build up a smaller center surround, you, feel, you, you line them up in the right way, then you can build up a more complex cell, which is, uh, you know, can detect something more important. So this is the simplest, you know, this is sort of like a perceptron. A single neuron, you see a bunch of inputs, right? You, you just linearly add them up and it goes through linearity. So that means this uh, feed for network is also useful, right? But even, I think what's interesting about this, I, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure whether you learned this in your visual lecture, is that actually, if you go to the neuron at the high level, let me see where, uh, I, I just mentioned this, very interesting, that the system behaves as if it's a feed for network, right? Just you can explain the complex response at the high level by just adding up the simple thing from the, from the, from the bottom. But anatomically, from the cortex, back to the uh, LGN, which is just thalamus, right? You have 10 times more feedback connection going backwards. But, but normally, they, as if they are not there, they're doing something, but it's very elusive. It's, you know, we don't really understand how this thing works, but, but it behaves as if it's almost like a feed for network. But even though anatomically, there are many, many feedback connections. It must be doing something important. Right? We have to mention that. <coughs> All right, so, if, it, if it's connecting together, you know, what, what can you do? So this is a McCulloch Pitts model in the 1940s, very old, so from MIT, right? They, they said if you have these kind of very simple binary neurons, these are on or off, right? You connect them up, they just have a threshold. They don't have many other things, right? They don't really have a memory except for like a reverberant activity, activity going through a loop, right? They don't have a very synaptic learning at that time. But they show that even for those simple network like this, uh, it can compute any logical function, right? Yeah, as you know, almost any device you connect no, you know, enough, they can, you can build a universal Turing machine, which is equivalent to any computer you can, you can use, right? So those things, as simple as this, is already good enough to be a universal computer, right? But even though it's not exactly right. <coughs> um, I think another progress in the 1950s is called perceptron. Perceptron is just like a model we just told you before, you just linear adding things up. So, but what is Im important is that this is by a, uh, Rosenblatt, it's a, it's a psychologist at Cornell, uh, Cornell University. So just w what he did was that he find a, a supervised learning rule to change the connection. It's a linear combination of the inputs, right? You, you may pass through non-arity, but, but how do you wire them? What, what's the weight, the, the Ws that we showed before, right? Uh, and it showed that this thing will guarantee to convert. You can, if you can, uh, if you learn to think that our, um, for problem linear separable, you can the, the machine always stops in finite steps. So let me get into a little bit of detail about this. This is kind of important uh, because this is the first learning machine which got people really excited at that time. <coughs> because it looks extremely simple, but it can work like a magic. You know, so this <coughs> for people who, who, who never heard of this. So this is a simple linear model, right? We showed that before. So the learning rule looks like this: <coughs> you change the weights based on the input and out output, right? If you have a bunch of inputs, what you want is that I want to, s your inputs correspond to some pattern. I want to classify into different, different types, like two different types, based on whether my output Y is a positive or, or negative. If it's a positive, I say, okay, this be up first class, or negative is the second class. <coughs> so the idea is that I give you some, some examples, a bunch of input output, right? The, the, the bunch of input and the correct, uh, uh, the correct output. I want the machine to learn the weights. Because the machine, you see the parameter just the weights and this threshold that can also learn. So if you, if you set up this weight, the machine is, 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 is a program, right? It's, it's, it's learned. So to change the weights, it's based on your inputs, the X, right? And the actual output. You calculate the difference between your actual output, given whatever you can start from a random initial states. So you, you calculate the difference between your actual output and your desired output, the capital Y. And then you multiply them, and there's a, a learning rate. Learning rate is just some small number. You don't want to go too fast, and the system may, may, may not work. And then, you, after many steps, then you will, the system will learn to do a correct uh, classification. Right? I'll give some example and see more clearly. And also, you're, I'll just give you um, a homework today, and you should be able to play with the system. You can, you can see for, for yourself how this works. So here's a very simple example. Uh, this is a, a bunch of people where they have different heights, uh, different weights, 
I want to classify them according when you give me the weights and how I want to guess whether there's a girl or a boy. Right? I'm not sure this is a good problem, but it's just a, just a one problem, right? <coughs> so this is like a like a stereotyping, right? So I, I assume that if you you know um, in this case you have three boys, two girls, you know, I don't know which boy, but if you if the boy is actually taller and more heavier than the girls, then you would plot if you plot the each data point, each data is a two two inputs, the weights and the height, and then you have uh, <coughs> it correspond to a single point. Right? The two different class with the two different different kinds of uh, points over here, right? If the two categories, the boys and girls, if they are linearly separable, that's like a straight line to separate them, then this machine can learn to do the classification. So in reality, it may look like this. You know, the boys go around, this is probably more realistic, they're intermingled. In that case, there is no way you can have a single line anywhere to, to classify them into two different, separate into two different categories. So the idea is this, once you learn, no matter how you learn, once you learn the W1, W2, the two weights, all right, and then if you set the output equal to Y, of course this thing equal to Y is a line, right, on this, in, in, the, in, this, in, this, in, this, in this, in the input space, all right. So any point on the space is have a x1, x2. So this is x1, the two axes, x1, x2. Uh, any point on this line correspond to this y equal to zero. So as you learn from geometry, on one side of the line, every point, the y will be positive, the other side, y will be negative, right? So that means once I learn the weights, then it, I, it will classify everyone fully on one, one side of the line to one category, <coughs> everything on the other side to a different category, right? <coughs> So the learning rule, <coughs> how do you get that learning rule? The learning rule can be derived by a gradient descent on some error. So this is where like a standard machine learning technique, right? If, if you want to minimize some error function, just try to <coughs> change it a little bit like a down the hill, right? So try to find the hill that uh, it's, uh, you have error that depend on your, on your parameter, different weights. I try to find a step that this error decrease the fastest. That's the simplest and possible. Um, learning rule. So if you assume that your error is your uh, the actual output of y and your desired output is a square, I, I don't care, it's, it's, it's absolute value, then you make a derivative of your error with respect to your parameter, which here is your w. Right? So this is, a, this is called the gradient. As you remember from your calculus classes, the gradient means the direction you move such that your function e increases the fastest. Uh, just like uh, you're standing on the hillside, you can look at different directions. When in one direction, that's going uphill that's in, in the most, sti most in the steepest way. So that's the gradient. So the gradient descent, uh, I use a gradient, I use a negative sign. So you go in the opposite direction, so you go downhill. So that's a faster way to decrease that error. Right? So you make it the, the, the partial derivative, uh, then you with your y, this, your, your, your small y has this linear equation we showed you before. You Sub substitute into there, you get derived this equation. Right? Derived this, derived this, 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 this learning rule. It's very simple. So in 1950s, this got the, it's a big, a very you know, exciting stuff. Like, like, like today's AI you know, stuff, people get excited. But this, this stuff didn't work, but there's because there's a Minsky, it's a AI lab, uh, MIT AI lab, one, one of the founders. <laughs> he showed that uh, this perceptron has a fatal problem because of linear separability, which is just, 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 just uh, mentioned. You cannot solve some even very simple problem like the XOR problem. Your X, why you either X, either one or two, but not both, all right? You can have either, at dinner you can, you can pick either beef or shrimp, but not both, right? So, so basically, you s your output is positive only if one is zero, another is one, but not the other two cases. If you plot this over here, input out of space, so you're, two different classes look like this. There is no way you have a single line can separate them. Even a simple problem like this, you cannot learn by a, by a simple perceptron. Right. <coughs> so the people was, you know, very, very, very frustrated. They didn't, uh, it took them like a, almost 30 years to, to recover. In 1980s, people got excited again because the discovery <coughs> of the back proper uh, mechanism I just gave you, uh, I'll talk to you in, 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 uh, in a moment. So the, the next, <coughs> I'm going to show you um, 
the simple, uh, how a simple net network can be actually useful, right? This is a simple linear network. How would that, you think, oh, this, you cannot even solve the actual problem. This is totally too simple. It's not, not interesting at all. Let me show you why this is actually very interesting. Even it's very simple. <coughs> now you have, uh, this is a two layer network. You have first layer, bunch of inputs. You have a bunch of output. If I s look at a single output, this is like a perceptron, which we showed before, exactly the same, right? The different output work independent of e independently of each other. So it's exactly the same. Then you get this, you write in the vector matrix form, which is your output vector times the weight matrix, right? Any cell potentially connected with every cell, and the times uh, your, your input, right? It's very simple. So the question is to optimal linear mapping is that you give me a bunch of input output. I find the weight such that in this linear system, it's to match the input output with, with the desired output as much as possible. It's a simple model. So this is you know, very, very simple. So, so if you do this, the solution is no. So you suppose you have, uh, you could, this is the, you, you have your input vector times your weight matrix equals output. This is what you want to be, right? Suppose I have a bunch of inputs. The first input, I use cap, uh, superscript one, means the first input pattern. This two is the second input pattern, another vector. So this is a corresponding desired output and the second desired output, all right? So what you want to do is to have this, so your, your, your input, the, the matrix, that is the matrix form, uh, times the weight equal to your output form. So this is just, if you, you know, column by column, it's exactly the same as this, right? I just write them out, out together in this form. <coughs> the solution, of course, typically you don't have a solution that satisfies exactly, right? This is not even, uh, the weight, the W, not even a, a, a square matrix. The solution you can best get is that I want to minimize the error between the left side and the right side of this equation. It's a least square solution. So that is a, has a well-known uh, solution because it uh, looks like this. So W equal to Y times X is a, is a dagger. Here means the pseudo inverse. So the more Penrose rows pseudo inverse. Right. Have you learned this in your uh, linear algebra class already? Right. Yeah. So this is a least square solution. <coughs> um, so here, I so a little more, but you can read this in your linear algebra class. But I just say that the, the pseudo inverse looks like this. If I have this matrix A, uh, which is a, uh, it doesn't even to be a square matrix, it could be M times N, right? So pseudo inverse can be formed by this kind of way. So first you have this matrix, it transpose time itself, right? This is always symmetric. There are two ways to do this. Well, either you go this way, A times A transpose. If A is, 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 a, is a rectangular matrix, the two matrix are different sizes. They're all symmetric, but they're two different sizes, either M by M or N by N, right? The different square matrices. As you know that one of them is always degenerate, but the larger one is always degenerate, right? Because you, you given a, a matrix, its rank, when number, you know, maximum number of linear independent columns were uh, rows, it's, of course, it it's always cannot be more than the smaller of the two, right? So the larger matrix form this way is always general. So you always have this, this inverse you can apply only to the square matrix that's actually not degenerate, this is a smaller one. So once you figure it out, there's only one way to form this kind of stuff. You look complicated, but it's not, right? So I'm not going to, to, to show you, but it's basically you have this, it, it is, it's, like, it's like a inverse in a way only in, only in one side. You go to the other side, it's not the inverse. So this is a sort of a simple way. Most engineers use this method, but if you use other standard method like a MATLAB, other is based on a singular value decomposition. I'm not going to delve into any detail, but I want to show you what why this kind of thing is actually actually uh, useful. Here's a simple example. You're going to uh, play with this in your in your homework as well. So it's very similar to this. So in this case, so each of your input pattern here is a picture. So it's made of pixels. Each pixel, so you put all the pixels together, it's form a big vector. Right? You concatenate this matrix as, as a big vector. So this is what just one vector input. This is another vector, another input. All right. So in this case, uh, what they show that this is by uh, by Cohonen called auto associative memory. So the idea is very simple. So you basically have a perceptron. You map the bunch of inputs x, the bunch of vector that basically here just shown in the image. As you can see clearly. Uh, you pass through some weights and back to yourself. So do you think this, uh, this is like, a, you know, like a silly, right? Why don't you use the uh, identity matrix to time you know, back to yourself? That's not, not interesting, right? What they did is that they used that auto-associative memory to get this pseudo-inverse solution, right? 
So what you got is that each of the pixels is connected to every other pixels. Of course, if I show, uh, if I, if I, you know, once I learn this, you get it. it this is like a, it's like a, a single layer perceptron. I like a, from input to map to output. But here, that if I just map to myself, I just use that to learn the weights. All right. Once that's done, if you show the the use this as the input, you of course you get this back as output because it's a map to itself, right? But the interesting thing is that if I use only a part of the image, right, this is not the full image, only half, or some image with noise, with decrypted, this output looks like this, right? <laughs> you see, I show this, this is the right side of the face, and then you can recover the full face, right? The reason is that, I, I like identity matrix, identity matrix is I map one pixel to that same pixel in the same location. Here it's different. So each pixel in the output, they receive input from every other pixel in the entire image. So if I damage some part of it, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's here, you only show the eye, it recovers the whole thing. So that means it could also associate in the sense that when you learn this stuff, this, this eye is like associated with the nose, mouth, everything else. Right? So if I only show you part of it, you know, wh which is the person that looks like, I look like this, you can recover the whole thing, right? You see here is that what we use is just simple perception, linear combination of inputs are very, very, very simple, right? You, we optimize that stuff. Turns out that optimization rules, the pseudo inverse is exa exactly the same as that gradient descent for the uh, perceptual learning rule. If you, you know, learn gradient descent all the way, you go, let it go to the, go to the minimum, you, you minimize the square error, right? The solution is exactly the same as this. Right? So you see, this is a very simple thing, but it's behaving, some of the people first show that, it's very amazing, right? You, you, don't, you, you see, this is such a simple thing, how you can to give you half the face, you can recover the other. <laughs> Sounds like magic, right? It's, but it's, just, it's, a very, it's very simple. Another thing about this is that, if you, what happens if you cut the connections? So you see that all the pixel in this output connect with all the other pixels. If I cut 10% of the content randomly, does thing still work? It still works. Right? It's worse, but not much worse. It's different from you know computer. If I cut 10% of the wire in the computer, do you think this is going to work? You cut a single wire, maybe it won't work. <laughs> it's much more robust, much simpler. Right? It's more like a start to be like a like a brain-like, right? even though it's very simple. <coughs> so the this is just like a only two layers. Like if you add more layer, it could a multi-layer perceptron. You add a hidden layer in here. Uh, this is input, right? Hidden layer, output, right? So if I only kind of any two layers, it's exactly the same as the perceptron we showed before, right? But you, but you have just many more layer. So this will be useful if they are all linear. That doesn't work. You have many layer or same layer, still linear system. It doesn't make no difference. The difference is that because each you, with each unit, you have a nonlinear game function we showed you before, the monotonic or sigmoidal kind of function, right? Then you add a nonlinearity. You have more and more layers, the system will be more and more powerful. Right? The three layers is the simplest one, the simplest multi-layer perceptron. So this, you use the system, you can easily solve this, this x word problem because nonlinear is separable. If you add this nonlinearity, then you can, your decision boundary is no longer linear. It can be much more complex. So this is one, one example that you have two input neuron, there's output neuron, all right? So these things here is like, so like, a, like, a, like, a, like a threshold. If one of the cells is on, right? Uh, so this is not enough to cross threshold 1.5. You have to be both on, you, so th this number is, is a weight. So if both cells are on, the input is total two, that you see this is threshold. If one of them on, it's not enough to threshold, threshold so this cell, that, that doesn't work. So you have this positive thing add up here, two, two, over the threshold, so this thing's off, right? This thing's on, okay? One of them on is okay. If both of them on at the same time, you make this cell excited, right? This cell, the inhibitory effect, it turns this thing off, right? So this can easily solve the x problem. problem. There are many different solutions, it's very easy, it's just one, one example. <coughs> so for the multi-layer perceptron, how do you learn the weights? How do you learn the weight? There are many more weights. So the method is the same thing. So your output depends on your input, depends on the permit, all the weights, all the threshold, all the other stuff. You do the same trick, it's gradient descent, right? Now I, uh, people have, you know, derived this rule, they call the back propagation rule. It's basically, the, it's gradient descent on this kind of multi-layer network. Exactly the idea of a perceptron, but it's just like a, have more layers. 
So once you had the multi-layer system, extremely powerful. That's why people were very excited in the 1980s when those things, first thing was, was discovered. People applied it to many different problems. This is the one early example. It's called the pronunciation of English, right? So basically, this is a text. This is a section. So you basically have an input. There's like seven different inputs. Uh, you want to pronounce the letter in the middle, right? These other things on the left and the right are the context right, surrounding that letter. So you basically give a bunch of examples. You teach the system just like well, sure, like gradient descent, and try to you know minimize, you know, ch change the way such that you make the correct pronunciation based on what's the correct, what, 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 what's the correct one, right? So people, if you, in most of you, I think uh, English is your uh, mother tongue, right? You never realize, you know, how difficult it is to pronounce English. If you learn a foreign language, maybe you you get the idea. <laughs> but foreign language actually turns out like in Germany, there is no spelling B because in the German, <laughs> you, when you look, there's only one way to pronounce the word. So there are no very, but for English, it's very, it's very hard. Right? It's very hard. If you are English, your mother tongue, you are you are the lucky one. So, so it's, it, there are many rules. There are exception to rules, and, and the exception to exception is extremely complicated. You want to make <laughs> make it right. So the, the linguistic have find out many, many rules, but if you use all the rules, you're still not able to pronounce everything correctly. Right? But for this system, the difference, the difference here, as I, I just showed out here, you don't, I don't teach you, you know, how to pronounce English. I don't, I don't give you the rules. You learn from examples. Right? You learn from examples. You have a bunch of examples. I just show you what's the correct pronunciation. Then all the rules are sort of implicit. You learn in the connection ways of your system. It turns out the system can learn this English pronunciation in a pretty amazing way, but not perfect, but much better than you know, many <laughs> linguistics rules. So that, that, that gives you lots of ideas, right? Maybe your brain, sometimes we don't really know the rules, right? You, you, if, have, if I have a small kid, I told you, oh, this is a cat, this is a dog, right? You give a few examples, you just got it, right? You don't say that a cat would be 20 centimeters long, not longer than whatever, the head should be this wide. You don't give that, right? Just give some examples you figure out. So it turned out that this idea is actually very important. That you, it's very different from the classical AI approach. Project because is really very explicit, right? It's very hard to deal with real world problems. But you learn from example actually much better. <coughs> Here's a summary of this uh, <coughs> multi-layer perceptual learning. <coughs> uh, it's a feed for network. Uh, it can approximate any given input output relationship to arbitrary precision if there are enough hidden units. So this is a mathematical result. I'm going to go into the details. It's very uh, complicated. So basically, for this kind of structure, so if you have enough hidden layer, even just for three-layer network, you can use that to approximate any input-output mapping to arbitrary precision you want. So as you know that you remember you have um, in your mathematics you learn you can use Taylor theory this is all polynomial to approximate any function, right? or you can use maybe sinusoid to approximate any function. So that's sort of, sort of a, like, a, like, a, like a Fourier theory. So here is different. Like you use a sigmoidal function that's that, that's a linearity. You combine them to approximate any function. So that's all. That, that, that's all. This also works. <coughs> Uh, the parameter you can learn by minimize uh, your actual output and your desired output. That's sort of the learning rule. The problem is that this, um, it is not perfect because you have the problem with local minima, right? You want to find the lowest error places, but there are, you know, in overall possible parameters, there are many different local, many different local minima. And a common problem, you're stuck in the local minima. So, so in theory, it works. In practice, you're always stuck in the local minima. So, so it's not always working. <coughs> um, yeah, the so learning rule is not local in the sense that you modify synapse weights. Uh, it's not just the two neurons in question, but the whole network actually involved. So I'm going to talk about learning rule in my future lecture. Um, so uh, I'll give you more examples in the future. Um, in the last few minutes, I mentioned some re uh, recent advances. Um, it's very related to the perception. One is called support vector machine. It's very, people use it a lot, the classification and other problems. <coughs> Another called deep network. Deep, uh, deep network learning. Have you heard of the deep network, deep learning? Yeah, it's very hot right now. So I'm going to do a quick example. So the idea for the support vector machine, it's a, a very similar to perceptron. Right? You know that in this case, suppose you have two dimensional input space, each point is an uh, input, right? The perceptron just really learn a boundary, it's, got, it's usually it's a line in a two-dimensional space, a hyperplane in a high-dimensional space. 
on the one side you cluster in the one class, the other side the other class, right? <coughs> but where is the location of the line? You can do this or this one, right? It's different. One. This one you, you increase the margin in the sense that you want to have a longer distance to the to the border cases. Right? This is more robust, right? If you have a new case which may fully make you know, here, I mean new case may actually, you know, close across the line. So this is very, you know, it's based on the perception. The simplest idea is based on perception, but you try to find the boundary in a more clever way to maximize the, mar the, mar the margin. So in this case, the case is close to the margin called support vector because the input is a vector, right? So the case is far away, doesn't matter. So there are di you know, different ideas in psychology. That you, you, in this case, would be if you try to classify girl and a boy, this bordering case would be a girl, but actually more like a tom tomboy, right? This is like some more feminine guy or something like that, right? So the, 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 the bordering cases. The other idea is that you use like a prototype. I find you know, a, bir a bird would be like a ruby would be the standard bird. A, a penguin would not be a standard bird. You know, as you find something to some prototype. So this is one idea, use the, 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 use the border case to do classification. So this is the very basic idea that grew out of this, this, this perceptual idea. So another more recent event is this so deep net network. Right? Just a few weeks ago, I right, heard this AlphaGo. Have you heard of this? Uh, Go? Because a Go game is an Asian game like this. It is a sort of like a holy grail of this kind of a board game because it's considered the most difficult. Only humans good. It's only you know one place where humans still better than than a machine. About ten years ago, IBM had the Deep Blue. Right, it is a bit a grandmaster of, of chess. Right? But, but in that case, they use sort of brute force search because their computer is faster and beat uh, the Kappa Prof and uh, this uh, grandmaster. So about 10 years after that, about t t uh, a few weeks ago, uh, they use this deep learning network, which basically multi-layer perceptron with many, many layers. I don't know how many layers here, but a typical artificial intelligence now they can use like over 100 layers. Or so. So what's the advance now is that we have more data, the data is larger, you have many, many more data. So they basically this machine know all the game already played in the past, right? They also play again itself, <coughs> accumulate a lot of data. <coughs> so the data is huge. Another computer actually faster, right? You have this Moore's law, the computer always faster, one year and a half, of, but it's probably reaching the, the limit, but still you know, getting faster every year. <coughs> And there are, uh, there are several tricks used here. One is like a reinforcement learning I'm going to talk about in my future lecture. Another case is this, this deep network. Right? The deep network is able to learn something very compl complicated patterns. Because we, have, we already know that the simple thing that already work, but this is, you know, you need many layers of more complex like nonlinear relationship. But you combine that, it turns out it's, um, it's surprised many people in the field that it's, this thing happens so fast. Just it's, or it's, it's, it's already possible, like a machine like this is already comparable with the best human player, sorry. So in, in your homework, uh, we only focus on two layer network, right? You, of course, these networks, you have many layers, but you know, you look at the two, you have to understand how the simplest case works. So you just play with your homework. The homework is not very difficult. Just go through it. It's just a computer exercise. You get the idea, if I only have a two layer, how the system behaves, you get some intuitive idea how the thing actually works. All right, okay, that's all for today. Thank you.